um, I think everyone. So, uh, well, firstly, welcome to our uh, annual Summer SaaS conference and to the uh, DevTools pitching track. Uh, thanks a lot to, um, you know, for, for joining and for making it. Um, maybe we can start with uh, our jury uh, and sort of a quick introduction from each one of you guys, if, if, if you can. So maybe we'll start with Mike. Sure. Um, Mike Reiner, general partner at uh, Acrobat Ventures. We're pre-seed seed fund, investing tickets between 150K and 1.2 million, primarily in companies with an interesting data angle. So labs, AI, machine learning, um, enabling infra, cyber security, that stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, Simon, how about you? Hey, nice to meet everyone. Uh, Simon Menashi, partner at MMC Ventures. We're investing at Series A up to about 10 million pounds and at Seed up to about 1 million pounds. And we back companies applying data science and AI either in the application layer or in the infrastructure layer. Uh, so back to a lot of uh, dev tool and open source and core companies. So uh, really good to be here. Looking forward to it. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Tom? Yes, hi everyone. Nice to be here. I'm Tom Hendrickson, a general partner at OpenOcean. Uh, a round uh, B2B data software uh, investor, I would say a good 25-30% of what we do is in the in the space that we are here to talk about today. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. And uh, while we're getting Julian on board, I can do a quick intro for himself. Uh, so Julian is a partner at the Redline Capital, and uh, in parallel, he's a very active angel investor with about 30 um, so personal investments. So uh we're very happy to have him on board hopefully uh we can see him on the stage shortly um but with that uh why don't we move into into the uh pitching itself and uh start with uh pavel from balancey pavel do you mind starting yes i would love to thank you okay so you'll have you'll have four minutes once you can share the screen please tell me if you see my screen yeah. Yep. Sure, sure. Okay, let's start. Perfect. So, hi everyone. My name is Pavel, and I represent Balancey. Balancey is a platform which helps game developers to build, monetize, and run live services in their games. Gaming market faces very serious challenges right now. User acquisition it's not transparent anymore, and it's extremely expensive. So everybody, and especially big publishers, cannot keep growing using classic user acquisition. So the only way for them to grow is through better monetization and personalization of experience. And LiveOps is the obvious solution to do that. It's a proven fact that games with LiveOps generate two, three times higher LTV than the game without it. All top grossing games are using live operations as the main source of their monetization and engagement tactics. There are 50,000 of studios and publishers in the world who generated almost $200 billion in revenue last year, and all of them are facing exactly the same problems running live operations every day. If a studio wants to succeed today, they have to think about monetization and live operations early on, or they will lose the competition. This is actually the reason why Balancey was born. We empower developers to think about monetization and live operations from day one. First of all, Balancey helps building the game. Secondly, Balancey helps monetizing the game by creating dynamic in-game shops with personalized items, segmented pricing, and of course, special offers to the right audience at the right time. Thirdly, Balancey helps live service your games. You can launch any in-game campaigns, game events. You can A-B test anything you want completely remotely. And on the top of that, we provide ML and, MI M and M AI to optimize and automate a lot of your processes and additionally improve your KPIs. Here is one of the test cases from our customers, Hot Siberians. In just two months, they were able to dramatically increase conversion and RPPU of the game by running a series of experiments. And as a result, in just two months, they doubled their revenue. We have 20 paying customers, very high gross margins, and just three months of payback period. During the last six months, we have been growing 65% month over month. And uh, to keep up with this trend, we are fundraising. 
We are a distributed team of 10 super efficient people. Myself and Andre, we have been working together for more than 13 years so far. For the last five years, we were building our own gaming studio, which got money from Y Combinator. And actually, that experience led us to build Balancy. Yulia, she is our head of growth. Uh, she has been in the industry for more than seven years. Uh, she came to us from dev to dev analytics system, and she's already great help for us. We have hands-on investors and advisors who are actively helping us in the areas of business, marketing, and product development. And just recently, we got accepted to AWS B2B SaaS acceleration program. Uh, we need $2 million to dominate this market in two years. And we already have half a million dollars committed by a number of angel investors. Uh, we are getting new customers right now through direct sales, but at the same time, uh, we are planning to become world-known experts in live in live ops and dramatically increase brand awareness by attending gaming conferences, releasing educational content, and of course, investing into marketing and PR. Uh, we know how to get to one million dollars MRR in just two years, and we invite you to our journey. My name is Pavel. We help gaming studios to win in this very competitive market. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. Right on time. So uh, I'll open the floor to, to questions from the from the investors. So let me let me start here because OpenOcean actually doesn't really invest either in the games, which is obviously consumer or offerings to game developers. Although we otherwise do do de uh, developers. So I'll start with a very basic question. My perception would be that the big platforms, uh, you know, the supercells and kings and so on, they have everything that you're talking about here already. So I wonder what that leaves uh, for an actual market opportunity. What is the real market size here? Uh, thank you, Tom, for this brilliant question. You're totally right. Uh, giants like Supercell, they have uh, similar tools made internally. This is true. Uh, for that reason, we are currently focusing on the other like 49,000 of developers because it's 100, 1,000 are already have some kind of tools. So the market is pretty big uh, in terms of the amount of developers. But the size that they have is not as big as the top guys for sure. Uh, but when we were doing uh, interviews uh, with the biggest guys like Zynga, Zeptolab, Outfit7, uh, when we showed them what we have so far, they confirmed that the internal tools, if, if, if they have it, yes, but they're not even close to be as good as what we provide. And our current plan is to grow with mid and small size companies, uh, implement ML and AI technologies uh, with a lot of automation and with this much more advanced solution come to the big guys uh, because we already see a very high interest from them. The only reason why we're not jumping into that direction right now is because we are small and there are just a lot of risks for them. And the sales cycles will be too long for us, and we need to show constant growth. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe I'll continue um, next to the market question. I was also wondering, you go to market. So you mentioned two I years to get to Mike ten million. Asking something. You can't hear me. I can. Pavel, can okay. you hear me or not? I cannot hear Mike. Can you uh, say what he asked? So the question is, how do you get to 10 million ARR in two years? How, how, do you get, how do you get to 10 million ARR in a couple of years? And which would be kind of the dominant channels that take you there? Uh -huh. So we are planning, as I mentioned before, we're doing direct sales. This is a main source of uh, user acquisition for us. Uh, but we are planning to put much more effort into marketing and PR because even uh, a small effort we do right now, such as uh, weekly deconstructions of different games, implementing templates for balancing. Let's say you are a new company and you're starting a new project and you don't know where to start with live ops, and even though you know that you need it. Uh, we have a lot of templates like I want a shop like in Clash of Clans Supercell or I want some other uh, weekend activities from Playrix games. We have such templates which you can start using. Of course, you have to adjust them for your specific game, but at least you will have something to start. Uh, and such, um, such materials actually help us to build brand awareness. And we started noticing that uh, whenever we called uh, reach someone, they already either read an article or heard something about us, or sometimes even they just come to us. So it's like an inbound. Uh, but the majority of the clients from that, uh, actually, it's, it will be 500 clients to get to $1 million MRR. 
medium sized company. So we just need to do direct sales to 500 companies. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, maybe time for just one quick one. Uh, if any other yeah. questions. Great one for me. Thanks, Pavel. That was really great. Um, the, my assumption is you have to get in pretty early in the development cycle because once they pick one platform to help them, they're not going to switch post launch. Is, is, is that right? And if so, how do you get to those companies mm -hmm. early on in their, in their development cycle? Uh, actually, it's not necessary to do that. Uh, of course, if someone early on comes to us, this is the sweetest uh, spot for us because it's super easy to get on board. And after a certain time, it will be super hard for them to get rid of us because they will just too tight to our technology already. And there will be no, not make sense to change us. But majority of the clients which we got uh, were the games were, which were live for a year or two already. They just did not have live ops at all. Or they were using spreadsheets or JSONs file to run live operations. Or just hard-coded different offers for specific timing. So programmers were responsible for that in most cases. And once we showed them that uh, after a very easy migration, which might take uh, from two to seven days, working days, uh, they will be able to completely uh, remotely operate the game. And uh, no programmers will be involved at all. Which means that uh, monetization managers and game design managers, well, they will be they will have much more power and uh, they will be able to run a lot of experiments without interfering with the rest of the team. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Pavel. Thanks, thanks for your presentation for answering the questions. Um, so next, uh, could we have uh, Turaj from APSI presenting? Hi. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Right. I can, perfect. Can I see the screen? Yeah, you're yep. good to go. Perfect. All right, hello everybody. I'm Turaj, founder of Atsi. We have introduced the first AI power app builder. We are based in LA and we already gained some recognition. Currently we are number one LA startup among 350 by Hacker Noon and many more. So the problem we are trying to solve is how to turn my brilliant idea into an app. Everybody has a problem probably. The, uh, there was no solution before we had started. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for 1,500 apps that are being added to the app stores, 80% of them fail. It takes about five months to build the app. It takes about three months to learn for new beginners how to use the existing tools. 90% of them uh, end up with a poor UI in the app generated. If you haven't used them, uh, I'm talking about the low-code tools, by the way. They require zero or a small amount of coding. But really, it doesn't mean that it's easy. People still have to use, uh, go through uh, designing the UI, going through the workflows, building the data model, setting up the integration. So a lot of things that they have to do in order to build the app. So what was the solution? We decided two years ago that AI was the solution. We started building our product on top of that. So with our tool, people speak their mind and AI understand them, uh, them and build it for them. It takes hours versus months, and they end up with an elegant-looking app. To give you an idea, this is, uh, I cannot give you a full demo here, but this is how it looks like. It's a web browser user go there, and they start engaging with the AI. They talk with it, it asks questions based on that in a real-time manner. It actually uh, builds them the app and takes them through all of the configuration required to build them an app in a, maybe in a few hours. So how do we stand out uh, against the market? So we can look at it from two aspects. One is level of sophistication in the apps versus level of effort requires to build the app. On one corner, we see a static website builder such as Big Squarespace and whatnot. On the other side, we, can, we see low-code builders. It's a crowded market. Uh, uh, you can build sophisticated apps, but they are not easy. Apps is uniquely positioned, where, whereas you can build very sophisticated apps in a simplest manner. How do we use AI? Currently, we, we are using AI as a developer. We build AI is building what they want. Uh, but uh, in the next few quarters, we are also going to use AI as a business analyst, whereas it tells the user what they need. So basically, it's not just building it, but also providing consultation on top of it. Our business model is subscription-based. Uh, the price is between 100 to 1,000. As soon as, as the app goes live, the subscription begins, and they can terminate at any point. Um, our CAC is 600, our LTV is uh, 10 times that, 6,300, and uh, on average, they, spend, they send on their subscription for 18 months. We, cu we currently have traction. We are at 700 ARR, and we expect to hit 1.5 million by end of the year. 
it's a huge market. So far, we are just uh, this year, we are uh, focusing on uh, USA small businesses, which is a 17 billion market. Within that, we are yeah. this in four sectors. And uh, by end of 2024, we are going to uh, expand into uh, all 15 sectors uh, in the USA. And then we are going to expand globally. We are currently raising 2 million and previously raised 700K from angels and accelerators. 55% uh, of it is going to be spent on sales and marketing, 25% on R&D. This is a team, four-member four team. Among us, we've been, we've been managing teams of 100 plus at Fortune 500 companies, went to the best accelerators. We have doctoral research in AI and NLP and 40 years of experience in uh, sales and marketing. We also have a great ad team of advisors. Most of them come from uh, major tech firm, ex uh, tech firms, and there are executives there. Plus, we have a, a Paul, who is a professor at uh, USC. With that, I would like to thank you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Perfect timing as well, Tiraj. Thank you. So again, the floor is open for questions. Maybe a quick one. What's the key mode here? So we'd be interested to know what technology you're using and how you're going to prevent others, you know, can join the market. Uh, you're asking what technology we use to generate the apps or how technology? Yeah. So are you just building on top, like, or are you like, what's what key tech did you build yourself? Okay. Uh, everything is built from a scratch for us. We are not using any third party. Uh, uh, we uh, the only thing we integrated actually was ChatGPT into uh, the beginning uh, session. So when, once you start the building your app, we, we had our own NLP to uh, get the information from the user. But ChatGPT does the conversation better. So at the beginning, when you start, uh, we call it ideation to talk about your app and give more information to collect whatever user is thinking. We are using ChatGPT, but other than that, everything else is our own proprietary technology. And a bit, a bit in the same vein, um, impressive. You know, many, many things there look really great. How is it different from Sutro? I haven't seen Sutro. Um, is it a low-code or no-code platform? It's a similar one. It doesn't have the visual. I'm talking to it and it's building. But it, it is, a, 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 if I recall correctly, a text interface for, for explaining what you want. And then it, it starts okay. building it for you. Okay, just based on what you say, if it doesn't have the UI, UI is very important when you are building it, your app. I mean, in software engineering, one principle is uh, you, you, you will get what you see. We see Wiggy, right? So you should see what is in front of you. So if you can't see in front, oh, no, in front of you. It has the, don't get me wrong, it has the UI for seeing what it wants to build. But, uh, you know, I thought your, it was a bit of a gimmick, but when you have a conversation with it, that yeah. was very visual. But here you, in text, you describe what you want, right? Yeah, that's conversational. You can talk, talk or type. Either of those is going to work for us. Uh, on top of that, the, uh, allow the user to actually do everything else that they can do in uh, like local platforms. You can actually go into a one screen and start adding components, taking them off, customizing very tiny, minor detail. And uh, probably as users, uh, become more professional they can they, instead of just talking maybe they want to just go there and do all of those things so that would be uh, may, probably one difference at the same time we try to uh, focus on sectors which is very important we uh, it's not just build your app from buttons and inputs because that's not going to work the majority of the time it's that's why it takes a long time we are fo focusing on sectors and what it means that we have very specific elements features for those sectors. For e-commerce, we have uh, advanced payments, subscription and whatnot. And as we move on to each different sectors, we come up with very advanced features and elements that building them from scratch would have taken months. For us, it probably takes a few minutes. All right, I like the latter part of your answer. The first part I didn't like because you didn't know Sutra, but you speculated how you might be different. But thanks. Exactly, you read my mind. All right, let's have one more. Julian, want to ask something? Um, no, I, I'm finished. Thanks very much, Taraj. Um, the, obviously, as you know, the majority of the work with an app is not the initial generation. It's building it out, iterating it, improving it, getting user feedback, testing, playing with conversion, and so on. How, what kind of capability have you built in that area? And 
I guess I'm challenging the idea that you can build the most sophisticated apps using this technology as opposed to relatively simple apps. Sure. So uh, uh, once you uh, are done with building the application, you say I'm published now and that's it. In 30, uh, 30 minutes, you receive an email to uh, build your, uh, start testing your app in your phone, iOS or Android. Uh, we offer a three-day three trial version, so users can uh, try it for free. If they like it, they can come back and uh, build a subscription. Uh, at any point, you can come back to the platform, uh, load your existing applications, and make any changes and publish again. Uh, if you don't add any feature, the price doesn't change. If you add more features, more, more extensive features, the price will change. But uh, you can unlimited. It is you have unlimited chance of coming back and making iterations. So as as much as you want, and that uh, helps user to uh, basically try it out, come back, and uh, be on top of what they already have. Great, thanks. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Siraj. Just, just, just one, one last question. Um, sure. Could, could you talk? You, you mentioned it kind of was sixty dollars a cap. I think. think. Um, could you just talk a bit about what your actual approach is to customer acquisition and how that would scale as you went more international and kind of I suspect the competitive environment would be a little bit more robust. Yeah. So uh, our focus has been on small business startups and individuals at, at the beginning. Uh, more. Uh, they work it works better for us. Less integration, easier to sell to them. We don't need to expand to uh, other parts of the board. Although we already have customers from all over, all around the world, as you saw, seventy percent of them are in the U.S. Rest are in the rest of the uh, world, Japan, Europe, everybody, everybody else. But the U.S. itself is big enough for us, and when we are thinking about spending our marketing. Maybe we, that's why we want to stay in the U.S. to have more concentrated market sales and marketing. And that's going to be good enough to get us to 10 million next year and 24, 25 million the year after that. Uh, of course, uh, it, there is no reason for us to stay in the U.S. other than marketing and sales. That's why we want to expand into global. And uh, uh, so it becomes a he, he bigger market in terms of uh, what we can reach. And uh, pretty soon after that, we are also going to uh, like uh, start looking at enterprises because our tool, as we've been talking to uh, bigger companies case by case, they really like it. They say we can also use it in uh, ent at enterprise. The thing is that we don't have the bandwidth to sell to them at this point. Thanks, Taraj. Thanks a lot. Um, you, okay, let's let's move to the next one. Uh, Alex Harris from Adidot. Uh, you'd be next. Hi, guys. Hope you can hear me. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Let me know when you can see everything. Um, always fun to be using a new tool like Hopin. Haven't had much, much experience with it. Okay. Uh, I think I can present. Can everybody see my screen? I think we can. Excellent. Okay. Let me just click present. It's a bit slow for whatever reason, I think, bandwidth, but. Um, Fingers crossed. So essentially what we are is a tool that uses big data to help developers get to up to 500% more effective uh, by essentially creating cycles of continuous improvement. Uh, we take a stance that in the next few years, whilst AI is gonna be optimizing mostly the kind of text to code functionality uh, and part of creating code, um, the other part that's gonna be even more important is essentially the coder themselves. Um, and one of the biggest kind of challenges around engineering productivity, which is the problem that we're solving, is that you're going to have to go beyond code to understand exactly what makes a great team, what makes a great engineer. You can't just focus purely on code metrics. You have to focus on collaboration. You have to focus on essentially improving other, other aspects, such, for example, as focus time uh, in a team. Now, another facet as to why engineering productivity has been really, really hard to uh, resolve as a problem is that things like dashboards are infamously hard to understand, extract meaningful uh, conclusions. And the reason for that is because the data that you're gonna have to look at to understand exactly what makes a team or a developer tick is highly complex. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's kind of correlations between, let's say collaboration, quality of code. We are already seeing that in the data that we have. Uh, finally, in terms of adoption, anything that's very top down always struggles with developers. If developers are being monitored, if developers are being like essentially tracked, it does become a very, very tricky thing uh, to actually um, 
essentially install and adopt uh, fully in a company. Uh, so therefore, we try to essentially solve all of these three challenges in the way we approach uh, the problem. Now, what we do, um, we have a very scalable way of acquiring data. Uh, we have right now approximately 42,000 developer data sets. Uh, and this is through plugging into everything that a developer touches. So right now that includes GitLab, GitHub, Slack, and we use Slack as a way to get data, not just as a way to deliver notifications, which is what most of the industry does. Jira, Google Calendar. In the near future, we're also integrating to IDE systems. So essentially that would be the editors that developers are writing code and CICD. Um, tools, which are essentially your Heroku's, your Jenkins, uh, effectively the pipelines that developers are using to deploy code. So once we have that data, uh, we do we look in the in the uh, kind of network of a developer. So we look at everybody else you're working with uh, in a company, and we also look at the past. So we look at historical data, and this allows us to do three things: correlation analysis, anomaly detection, and momentum analysis. And through that. Uh, we effectively deliver personalized recommendations. So uh, essentially, we, we try to figure out what are the bottlenecks for the developer or the team, uh, how likely is, for example, uh, the sprint to be delayed and why, uh, and kind of predictively intervene and change some of those negative correlations and some of those negative uh, behaviors and double down on the positive ones. Um, now, effectively, this works out to winning approximately one day uh, of Per developer per week in increased productivity. Roughly for a company of 100 developers on US salaries, that effectively adds up to about 600k per year. Um, and in terms of being adoptable by developers, we have been voted by developers themselves number one product of the day on Product Hunt and number one product of the week in terms of developer tools. Um, in terms of traction, uh, we started uh, commercializing in Q1 after gathering critical mass in Q4 for our models. Um, and so far, we have a small kind of uh, contractual layer from design partners that's around the 36K. We have another 100K in pilot setup, which is being set up literally this month, another 200K in security and procurement, uh, which I'll talk about this a little bit further. And then we have about 2 million in, in active conversation uh, pipelines. It's already being used by unicorns like Blueground, uh, for example, and we have multiple customer testimonials that back this up. Alex, now, just, just just to know, you you're sort of have maybe 30 seconds to, to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fine. So this is purely the start. Uh, by 2025, we're hoping to be uh, essentially the leading um, data <laughs> effectively provider between the developer experience ecosystem, which will help us optimize things like hiring, things like benchmarking across companies, etc. Really cool team. Oxford Imperial backgrounds has worked in startups and unicorns before. And final, finally, we're raising two million primarily to unlock uh, ISO, uh, ISO and SOC2 uh, and get a data engineer that's going to help us with machine learning as well as um, a bit of resource going into sales. And that's it. I'm just going to stop sharing now. So I'm going to open up to questions. Thanks, Alex. Right. Who wants to start? Alex, I guess I'm interested in what, what are the most common interventions and, and how well do they work? Yeah, it, re it really differs per team. Uh, so what we found, our models are fully personalized, actually. This is one of the really interesting things. Every model gets tested. We have about seven models that get tested at the individual level. And then the three better ones, the three better fit ones get actually laddered up. So what that means is that each individual and each team is going to get different recommendations depending on their own data sets. So in terms of the most common ones, I would say uh, the most interesting ones, actually, what I find or the customers find most interesting is where you have cross-sectional relationships, where essentially you have situations where collaboration is what's causing bad code. And without using the system, it's actually really, really difficult with a naked eye to understand how, for example, um, not planning properly or how essentially not having enough meetings, for example, could cause you to have bad code three weeks down the line, right? The, so this is the stuff that's super, super interesting because you have leading indicators and lacking indicators. Actually, I have, a, I have a quick question on the urgency to act for customers, you know, exactly to your point, given automatic code generation right now, which is in, you know high priority for many customers, mm -hmm. how are you going to put yourself, you know, high enough on the priority list for your customers in the near term? Hi, Mike. Lovely to speak to you again. Always good to see a familiar face. Uh, it's a very valid question. So 
we had expected to see this being more of a problem than it actually is because what tends to happen we have customers that want to use this tool as a way to assess for example a co-pilot so they want to look at okay what is the impact if we use an ai text generator tool like is our productivity going to increase so the good thing with us is that because the models are evolving essentially all that means is that the baselines will change but not whether you're going to use it or not, if that makes, if that makes sense. So that, that's, we actually find this incre increasing the use cases more than anything right now. And, and just to follow on from that question, is that a point in time solution or once they've used it and validated whether or not the Copilot app is worth its weight in gold or not, they would yeah. continue, why would they continue to use it? I mean, Copilot is one of the examples, right? Uh, I mentioned continuous improvement for a reason quite early on in the presentation. So one of the benefits of having those data models and not being a static dashboard is that that improvement changes and learns with the team, right? So there's always higher and there's always better. Every team can do, and there's quite a bit of gamification built into the system as well, which basically means that you're constantly striving for something better and better and better. So as a result, you know, this is something that you continuously use. You don't just turn it up once, diagnose, and then you're, you're good to go. So think of it like like jumping on a scale, realizing you're like 20 pounds overweight. You'll want to have a coach to make sure that, you, you know, you keep on improving versus, you know, okay, I've lost the weight and that's it. Got it. And, and, and do you provide things like Dora metrics as well? Just to... Very good question. We do. I'm going to be very honest with you. That's not where most of our customers find the value. So we have them because most of the customers are very familiar with them, but actually what we find is that they tend to be more occupied with uh, our kind of, we call them indices, but their scores out of one, one out of 10 in the categories yeah. of work collaboration and wellbeing. So they tend to focus on these more. Got it. So they're seeing you as almost incremental to the kind of the jellyfishes, the plural sites, the linear bees of the world. They solve a different problem than we do. So Jellyfish solves more of the conversation between the CTO and the CFO. They're called Fin DevOps. Mm -hmm. Ours is much more of a day-to-day -day operation. You're a developer, you're a manager, you need to manage this print, this delivery right now. It's not something that you look at every quarter or kind of once a month. It's a very right, much but, more day-to-day. But you're not, you're, not, you're not feeding into pre-existing developer reporting processes. You're providing a set of incremental data around efficiency to an extent so the way the way the system is being used by customers right now is that it piggybacks into existing ceremonies your stand-ups your retros yeah these are more yeah. of the day-to-day -day things and you know potentially Got it. Understood. Say, Understood. Report, right. yeah? yeah good all right thank you thanks alex um i think the time the time is up for this one as well so thank you thank you very thank much you. and for the for the great thank questions um, and now, uh, can we please have uh, Petra from uh, Code Now? Sure. Hello. I just let me share the screen. And... All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Petra Sovora. I'm here on behalf of Code Now. Uh, value stream delivery platform, CodeNow actually improves your top line by shortening time to market and bottom line by avoiding or redu uh, redu reducing costs from the DevOps automation or cloud automation point of view. Essentially, we want to abstract away complexity of uh, individual tools and tool chains at all major cloud providers plus some on-prem cloud providers and provide a uh, developer-friendly self-service portal. Which is, which is usable across the software delivery lifecycle. Essentially, we are mostly focused on microservice uh, architecture, even driven architecture, because it's proven that basically, if you want to improve your time to market, you need to focus on isolated teams and autonomy of, of uh, individual components. This can, on the other hand, quickly grow out of control from the financial or technical perspective. Next problem is that basically all the cloud providers are bringing their own uh, tool chains. And basically then if you are a professional services or a company or enterprise, uh, your developers are facing very complex environment they have to, they have to live at. To abstract away this kind of a mess, basically you have to prepare a, a lot of uh, or very complex environment, which is costly and takes a lot of time. 
from the number perspective, basically by slash data poll, only 32% of application developers can actually automate cloud infrastructure. And if they, those teams are then uh, uh, responsible for build and run and actually should run the thing in the, in the cloud, then they are facing a, a, a very difficult problem. Uh, Code now comes as a self-service uh, developer platform. It, it is infrastructure agnostic. It is based only on vanilla open source products and supports multi-cloud and hybrid cloud deployment. It is ISO 27000 certified. Essentially, under the hood, as I said, it's a uh, it's uh, the whole uh, life cycle. So we uh, Code now covers as the create, as the run phase of the software, and is focused on developer productivity using the best of the breed vanilla open source products. Therefore, unlike uh, a lot of our competitor, competitors, there is a clear exit strategy. So if you want to leave code now because it is purely GitOps oriented, you can always take your repositories where all the configurations are and you can actually run all those tools, or tools on your own behalf and maybe pay uh, the cost of your platform team. Uh, to sum it up, code now comes as a turnkey platform as a service. Essentially, saving a lot of DevOps effort, we are saving some developer time because of self-servicing and weight mitigation. We are major, uh, majorly decreasing onboarding and offboarding uh, of developers, therefore making vendor management way easier and contracting uh, uh, developers from abroad, for example. But the main focus remains time to market and cost reduction. Generally, we have a very seasoned team, mostly, uh, well, my past uh, IBM colleagues and, and uh, all of them were uh, uh, in uh, various roles in, in enterprises uh, involved in cloud native and microservice architectures, digital transformations. Generally, custom software development business is supposed to grow to over $1,000 billion in 2031, where it was roughly at $140 billion and it, uh, in 2021, therefore it is growing very fast and very quick. Only, uh, or let's say 55% of developers has then less, uh, have less than five years of experience. Therefore, it is not really feasible to expect them to be super, uh, you know, in all various uh, challenges that are part of the enterprise grade software delivery. Just the top 18 companies worldwide in the custom software delivery field that did actually got uh, something like $60 billion. And just the MR region was growing 38% year over year in 2021. Another point of view on the market. Sorry, the just 30 seconds. If you could All right, that. I will skip that. So basically our traction, we are at roughly 600K at the moment. And we are going to have $1 million by end of year. We are growing, uh, going to uh, get some late seed. We have been recognized by Gartner at Magic Quadrant for DevOps platforms this year. We gained some notable customers like Foxconn or DHL, and that's basically it. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, if I can ask a, a question, I, I believe in the in the need in the market for sure, and I assume that since you've knitted together the best of open source, you have a product that works. Let's talk a bit about getting customers, because you have a few. Do you know anything yet uh, really about the, the LTV versus CAC on those customers? Because they look to be fairly big and fairly different. So it makes me wonder how, how, how much you know about how this business is going to scale. Yeah, right. So basically, uh, we did our seed uh, investment uh, or get our seed investment like a year and a half ago. We used most of the money exactly to be looking for the product market fit on the past. We have did, we did actually got rid of the uh, startup segment, basically, as uh, unreliable small customers. We did our uh, gigs in the mid-market and large enterprises. Therefore, nowadays, we are avoiding the very large enterprises unless they deliberately come to us. And we are focused, let's say, on enterprises and mid-market companies. And the way how to sell over there, which is, I believe, scalable, is that uh, we basically uh, do something what we call continuous delivery assessment, which is like a 10 man days gig, which uh, where we do analyze way of working, infrastructure and application tooling and, and how it is actually enabling them to deliver at scale and at speed so they can uh, actually scale faster with confidence. Uh, and basically we have five, custom, five client architects 
or uh, consultants nowadays capable of delivering this assessment. So basically every three months, we are nowadays closing a new customer by using this method. Okay, so a little bit of a high, higher CAC method, slightly slightly yes. longer sales cycles. All it right. is, it okay. is, it is. Peter, how, how do you handle the complexity of on-prem deployment in particular? Uh, well, uh, how do we handle it? Basically, okay, so number one, code now, uh, as, as it is, is uh, based on a concept called immutable infrastructure. So we have uh, automation, so the whole platform itself is deployed by uh, robots, let's say. It's fully automated. Then there is a customization per, per customer because on-prem, okay, customer wants to leverage their own GitHub, their own GitLab, their own whatever. So then we have uh, these pieces implemented as, or, or automized, automatized as part of the implementation gig. And basically for Foxconn, for example, we did actually achieve on-prem air gap deployment through Jumpbox, you do, you do deliver actually uh, the full set of things. We do bring our own container registry, our own package registry on the way. And then the code now is actually installed against that after a customer does the security review of the installation package. It's like if you would bring a DVD, basically. <laughs> How resource intensive are these sales? Is there a large services component for a lot of hands-on support for onboarding what must be a pre-existing brownfield environment? Uh, uh, sorry, the, the question was, uh, how complex is onboarding of a new customer? Yeah, I mean, how, how much of this is basically um, services efforts in terms of having mm -hmm. to put your people on site to address, I guess, lack of um, maturity in the customer's environment? Right. So uh, basically, uh, we are separating customers into two categories. Either they are digitally native, and, and they did already face the consequences of uh, running their own Kubernetes and running their own stuff. Those teams typically they are able to onboard themselves because they uh, we just live uh, you know abstract away the complexity they don't want to do uh, uh, and they continue actually doing the application delivery and they know microservices already eventual consistency and all that stuff. So that that's actually they they are able to self onboard with a uh, very little help. On the other hand, there are customers who are not that far, and basically they are, uh, you know, in this monolithic waterfall-based kind of a uh, situation. And the best thing that works is that we run a three-month MVP, where we come to the customer, we deliver in three months one portion of their problem, they are shadowing us, and then they take over from there. Essentially, either the assessment or this MVP for in the future is supposed to be partner business model. So we want our partners to be doing that. We just don't feel like actually building a partner channel yet because we have tried and it is, let's say, expensive and uh, demanding a lot of uh, personnel on our side. So we need to get a bit bigger before building partner channel. But essentially, it is uh, professional services and we believe this will actually uh, generate business for our professional services partners. Perfect. Paris, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and then uh, the next uh, presenter would be uh, Permify. Uh, Ferrat, mm -hmm. uh, could you could you share your screen and, and present? Absolutely. Can you guys see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Amazing. Uh, so, hi, I'm Prad, one of the co-founders of Permify, and Permify is an open source authorization service for scalable, secure, and fine-grained access control systems. Uh, so, first of all, what is authorization? It's a process of controlling who can own, access, or do something in your, in your applications. For instance, in Google Drive, you can control the access rights of a document as well as folder, or in YouTube, you have your private list. So, authorization has a uh, big horizon and it's been a, it has been around for a long time but companies and security teams start taking zero trust and least privilege more seriously due to compliance standards and data breaches that's that requires new security measurements so basically a need for fine permission systems arise which existing legacy systems and methods does not like fall short basically and why is it? Because designing a fine-grained authorization systems is hard because of the coarse granularity structure of existing models and systems, which results 
IT management overloads due to role explosion. And we have had we have customers that had more than 700 roles for 5,000 employees that they manage. And existing systems also have mundane compliance, uh, complicated policy languages that kills developer velocity and productivity, as well as they are hard to scale in this cloud native environments where there's distributed data all around your microservice environments, which creates infrastructure bottlenecks. Uh, interestingly, uh, we have great solutions around identity and auth authentication, uh, yet every company basically reinvents the wheel with authorization. So they build a homegrown system, homegrown system hits a big bottleneck, and basically engineering teams find a workaround solution with legacy systems or themselves, and then that legacy system, that legacy system or uh, uh, workaround solution never lasts and big refactoring project starts with a, with a big team, basically. And that's where Permify enters, basically. Uh, we have built a scalable centralized authorization service that helps you to model your authorization logic easily with a simple developer-friendly language and connect your existing workflows, identity and authentication management platforms. Uh, after designing your authorization model and setting up Permify into your own service or using our cloud, you can basically build customer facing authorizations, user permissions, and employee access management systems. And Permify is uh, based on, inspired by Google's Zanzibar, which is Google's internal authorization system that scaled uh, Gmail, calendars, and more to trillions of access checks. And this approach basically picked up by other experts and teams at companies like Airbnb and Carta. Uh, so far, we have 1.5K stars in GitHub, stargazers from leading companies, as well as 180 million daily access checks, API calls, basically. And we just closed two big enterprise customers that skyrocketed that API calls. And we have 38 active instances doubling every month for the last three months. As you know, IEM is a big market and information security is a big market that's growing 10 to 15% year over year growth. And there is a big opportunity to create a new category for developer friendly authorizations, just like Stripe is for payments. 30, 30 seconds to, to wrap up, mm -hmm. please. Mm -hmm. And to video do that for communications. Uh, me and my co-founders known each other for 10 years. We are a team of five, which is three of our class co-founders. And uh, we have based on time and 500 startups before. So if you're interested in, we will be raising in three months or so. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, maybe a couple of questions. I think we have time for about two. I have a very brief one, which is, uh, how do you differ from Cerberus? Uh, Cerberus doesn't have a centralized ACL access control list, which is which uh, basically uh, blocks the, some sort of scalability in microservice environment. We create a centralized database for access controls, which is permissions, and basically in distributed data environments, we can just check a single place instead of going out and looking for every data in every microservice. Okay. And then just to build, build on that question, you know what, you, you showed some other players off zero, uh, for instance, Keycloak, what's the risk of other players going more horizontal? Like what's the risk for those players getting into our space? Exactly. Is that the question? Exactly. So we think this is a big market because almost everybody needs authorization. And Auth0 is trying to build something uh, internally. Uh, they have an open source project for this as well. Uh, and Keycloak actually have an authorization system that is like very a legacy system that problematic in terms of having uh, mundane language I mentioned. And we believe that's, 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 that's growing our market, to be honest. We don't see any problem around that. Honestly, if I, if I could just add to that very quickly, I've looked at a number of Zanzibar-based products. 
how do you think end users will choose between which of the open source um, Zanzibar alternatives to go with? Yeah, exactly. Uh, our main approach, our main difference is around first multi-store approach, which help you build cross application authorizations. So the reason we choose that approach and differ from other Zanzibar projects is we believe we are going to focus on the internal projects rather than customer facing applications. So for instance, one of our customers have 70 internal application with more than 600,000 uh, stakeholders. And with multi-store feature, they can build cross application permissions, which they cannot do in other uh, Zanzibar uh, based projects. And we are focusing on more on the inter internal applications rather than scalability side of things. If that makes sense. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, Farad. Okay, mm -hmm. and now uh, the last but not least, uh, Toby uh, from Bravo. Hi. Okay, let me share my screen. So, uh, one second. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, um, so I just want to say, so Torej, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't have Bravo on your uh, on your competitor slide because if Adela is there, we should be there too. But uh, so so we Bravo operates in a very similar space to the, the apps you guys, um, but it's a different way. So we're basically a tool for helping product teams um, develop um, native mobile applications with web speed, but in a flexible way. Um, let me just go back a second. Okay. Really, our thesis is that obviously the software the product development is changing rapidly. Um, we've got um, AI development tools coming out. You've got massively easy, easing a design collaboration and simplified deployment. But we believe that the way it's going to work uh, is that people will be kind of picking and choosing different things. They're not going to want to have a single tool to do this. They want to be able to get together exactly the combinations that make sense for them from all these different things going on. And also, I, I, I don't we don't see that the AI is going to solve every, every problem. You're going to need to have an accelerant rather than the whole solution. So I think our belief is about a mixture and we aim to help sort of fix that gap. Because particularly with um, mobile product development, product teams have a lot of issues and um, uh, they tend to, I'm sorry, sorry uh, they tend to give up um, on mobile development. Uh, iteration is slow because you need to get the actual apps out or installed to test them off of them. Um, it's very difficult to maintain the fidelity, fidelity of the design in the resulting application. Uh, it's not always easy when you're sort of, even the prototyping stage, it's hard to test with real data. And often, uh, you know, to, to work simultaneously on iOS and Android, it's very complex and resource intensive. You often need two sets of teams to actually deliver this as a product, go through the app store process. Uh, and even OpenAI itself with all its resources, it, it released iOS before it did Android. It didn't do them both at the same time. What we with Bravo is trying to kind of enable people to tap into these innovations without um, um, and that helping to move faster and getting past these, some of these issues with native development. Um, we actually, um, allow people to preview the, what they're building immediately um, using the Bravo setup. Uh, and, and that we do that by actually um, building the app directly from the Figma design. So we're not changing the workflow. We're working with the way that people work currently, um, but actually effectively build, connect their design to a backend system to make the app, app function, um, which means that they can get immediate results and they can do MVPs and iterates really, really fast. So not only does it get maintained design, design fidelity, but also enables the connecting to backend systems so you get real world data. And also the outputs simultaneously Android and iOS. So you're able to kind of step that issue as well. And obviously the, the mobile app development market is, is, is huge as well. So it's a significant market. In terms of our traction, um, uh, we've been revenue generating for a, a couple of years now. Um, the, the, there were 600 customers. The US customers, are, the segment is the biggest source of our revenue. Uh, we have over three times LTV to CAC, and 50% of our new traffic is organic or direct. Uh, how are we going to market? 
Um, we've recently been, we spent a lot of time looking at our user base because we get a lot of users who are interested in this sort of uh, Figma to uh, application development process. Um, but we're really focusing on product teams and that's what we're taking to market um, and, and, and focusing on the SMEs uh, in the US. Um, the channels we're going to really push on, uh, the paid marketing to really raise awareness of what Bravo and what it can do. Um, the content marketing to become the sort of thought leader in the space, because I think people aren't aware of what's possible now with some of these tooling and help them get through some of the issues that they have with mobile product development. Um, we're also leveraging solution partners, some of the uh, uh, companies that use Bravo uh, to build for their clients and leveraging their uh, bases, uh, user base. And finally, we've got a number of integration partners such as Xano Superbase and RevenueCat. Um, and by working with them, we can kind of amplify a message and get it, go over into their audiences. Um, finally, just to wrap up in time, we're looking for 3 million to accelerate our go-to-market strategy, increase our product marketing and customer success teams to increase upselling, um, and also to uh, start the initial start of our doing our outbound sales, as well as developing some um, Bravo Studio features for the enterprise. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks, Toby. So I'll kick off. Thanks for that. Um, we're seeing quite a lot of companies that are really coming out at the moment doing Figma to code or prompts to Figma to code or prompts to wireframes, et cetera. Um, and I, I'm interested in how you guys will stand out and also how you'll stand out without pumping loads of money into paid marketing, which I guess is the default for a lot of companies. But actually, to win in a busy market, you're going to have to do something that stands well, out. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, we've managed to, I mean, uh, 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 so if you put in Figma to mobile app now, I think we're number one. We're, our, our content has, we've put so much content out there already um, that we actually already have that. We don't need to put so much into paid marketing. Um, but yeah, the differential for us is, is the fidelity of the translation between Figma, but also because we don't generate code. And we're, we're trying to avoid the whole code step. We see, you know, trying to work with the, think of the existing product teams and say, look, uh, you've got a product, man product manager, you've got the UX designer, they're trying to iterate. We're trying to help them not only involve devs in when they're trying to build something, changing something in the back end. To make most of the changes, you, know, you can actually keep your Figma design in sync with the app. So every change you make to Figma, you can push through to the app. You don't need to have involved any rebuild to actually create that, which makes it a massive, massive speed up in, in the uh, iteration cycle. And I mean, it's, and I think we, we probably have the, um, it, it's pretty unique for us because not only are we doing this, what we generate is fully native. It's not using React Native. It's not using a web app. This is a fully native application. So we bet both all the functionality that's possible in, in, in the mobile device, but also the speed of iteration as well. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Nope, everyone's good. Sounds like a no. Okay, Toby, thank, thanks a lot for the presentation. But must have been very clear in the presentation that no no other questions. <laughs> I, I now see it. it's the last one, so it's what's supposed to stop now. So <laughs> no, really, really thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um I think that wraps up the uh, the pitching. So I would like to invite the jury members now to um vote. You guys should have the link uh to the voting tool in your um diaries. So uh, once we have your votes in, I'll be able to share the results on the screen. Okay, I um, I have the votes in, so uh, let me try and share the screen. So uh, by majority vote, or by more more votes than the others, uh, we have APSI, who are the winner uh, of this year's uh, Dev Tech. DevTools track. So congratulations. Um, and uh, we would like to invite you to proceed to the grand finale that 
uh, has literally just kicked off. I think the guys might be waiting for us to finish. So once again, congrats and uh, thank you Great. to everyone who participated. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you. you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.